listening to the best of the Martha Zoller Show. To hear the full show each day, tune in to AM550 and FM102.9 WDUN or log in to accesswdun.com and click the Listen Live button from 9 to 11, Monday through Friday. It is the Martha Zoller Show, and you know, when you try to force things, it generally doesn't work. Steve Moore's here with me today, and you know, poor old California, Steve. I mean, they've been the beacon of the middle class for their whole time until recently when they uh, went woke and they're going broke as because of their policies. Yeah, good, good morning, uh, Martha. And by the way, uh, I was just reading on Axios this morning, one of these political newsletters. They were saying, oh, you know, the, there's a big migration um which is pretty obvious um, to the southeast where you are, uh, states like North Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Texas, um, and then states like Arizona um, and South Carolina are attracting a lot of people. And they're saying, oh, people are moving to these places because, you know, they want warmer weather and sunshine. And I was thinking, well, wait a minute, you know, there's no place on earth that has better weather than California. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, you know, California is a little piece of paradise and yet people are leaving California. So yes, people do want sunshine and they want warmer weather, but come on, what's going on. And by the way, Hawaii, which is also an idyllic place is also losing population as well. So what's going on here is people are moving towards more lower taxes, lower costs, better government services and and more economic freedom and that's what's really driving this migration to the to the south which is by the way six states account for you know well over half of our economic gain over the last 10 years you know andrew young who was the former ambassador to the un he was the first black mayor of atlanta and of course was an ally of dr martin luther king he was in the studio a number of years ago and he said uh desegregation and air conditioning made the south rise again (laughs) yeah well i mean you know those two things were important no question about it uh, and actually, when I debated Paul Krugman, who's a very famous left wing economist, uh, won a Nobel Prize, you know, and I showed all the evidence of people me- leaving these, quote, progressive states like New York and my home state of Illinois and California and New Jersey and Connecticut, and moving to states like Georgia and Florida and Texas and Arizona. Uh, and he said, oh, that's just because of the weather. But, you know, they can't explain why people are leaving uh, places like California. So, we this is the biggest story in America today about the you know the shift in the center of power uh in the center of gravity towards the south and the south is really becoming the booming area that is really carrying a lot of the rest of the country on its shoulders yeah the big question the sixty four thousand dollar question is are they bringing their politics with them and that is yeah you know the big challenge because if you keep repeating yeah. the same thing if you're leaving california because you don't yeah. like it but yet you want the same kind of stuff here then you're not going to get it and well but, uh, yeah that's a great point and you know I'm, I'm writing this book right now called the blue state meltdown and you know that the so you make a really good point. So take an example, a state like Colorado. Colorado used to be a pretty red state, actually. And now it's a, it's turned almost to an entirely blue state. It's kind of purplish blue. And why is that? Because all these people left California, right? And they then they moved to, to uh, Colorado, but they took their politics with them. And they actually switched that state. Same thing with, like, New Hampshire is to live for your a die state and then all these people have moved from massachusetts to new hampshire and they try to get rid of the very policies that they brought but the new latest evidence for the last 10 or 15 years shows that people are the people are more likely to move now to red states like georgia and florida and texas are conservatives so for example new york has lost a half a million republican voters because they're just they don't want to be around these crazy progressive policies. So we'll see how that works out. But it looks like now America is becoming more ideologically divided and the people who are moving to red states are conservative voters. So uh, we've got, of course, you know, the the president seems to not be able to have a day where he doesn't have some bad news. Even the mainstream media is starting to report on it. What kind of shifts are you seeing from your perspective? Because the economic policy is not working, but nothing else is working either. 
Well, now Biden is on this uh, kind of uh, PR um, offensive saying Bidenomics worked and look at how great the economy is. And I'm trying to, you know, I think a lot of Americans are scratching their heads saying, what, you know, how out of touch is this president? The average American household has lost $4,000 in income, in real income adjusted for inflation, Martha, since Biden came into office. How, how is that a boom? <laughs> right. I mean, come on, people. And that's, of course, because of the Biden inflation. Now, to be fair, inflation has come down this time last year. Remember, Martha, ni- inflation at 9.1 percent, a, a highest level in, you know, 45 years. Now um, we're down to about 4.1 percent. But that's still, you know, that means prices are still rising uh, twice as fast as as, uh, as the Fed wants them to be rising. So I'm not buying it. I'm with the 70 percent of Americans who think the economy is headed in the wrong direction. So what do you see shifting at all, I mean, on the Republican side? I mean, it's still President, former President Trump is ahead, although he's lost in the last two <laughs> polls. He's lost some. He's below 50 percent in a lot of places. You're starting to see some traction, you know, yeah. but but not enough unless you see a big, you know, what do you see happening on the Republican side? Oh, I think that, the, the, that these crazy lunatic indictments against Trump and the continued uh, mistreatment of this former president. Look, Trump, in many ways, is his own worst enemy. But the fact is that these uh, indictments, these are the same people who spent two years on the fraudulent, you know, um, yep. the, the what the, the uh, Russia collusion. Remember that one? Yeah. They almost impeached Trump on a completely fallacious story. So I think in a lot of ways, people are rushing to Trump in a bit because they they realize that He's been treated so unfairly. But I do think you're going to see a very – I want to see these debates, Martha. I, I myself haven't decided. I want to see all these guys and, and women on the stage and see which ones perform. I don't know if it's going to be – you know, uh, Trump does have a big lead right now, but th- it's still pretty early. So let, But this is a great process, and let, let's see it uh, play out. I'm going to see the president in a, in a couple of weeks, and I'm going to just tell him, like, Mr. President, all you have to say – is are you better off than you were four years ago? Yeah, and don't talk. I mean, the the 2020 election folks are with him no matter what. He's got to bring back in, if yes. he's going to win a general election, he's yes. got to bring back in the people who he lost. And and But yeah, it's I hard agree. for him to do that. He says, I know I need to be more positive, but I can't do it. I mean, that's what he said basically to Hannity. Uh, yep. You know, you're exactly right. That's what he has to do. He has to broaden his base and, and keep it on the economy. And, you know, that he, you know, as he said, I built, rebuilt the economy twice. He rebuilt it from the Obama years and he rebuilt it after COVID. And so I think that's his main uh, drawing card is that he's a businessman. He knows how to do it. He's done it before and he can do it again. But, boy, we got some great candidates out there. I love Nikki Haley. I had dinner with Vivek Ramaswamy last week. He's got he's a 38-year-old yep. uh, Indian who's got great ideas. I like Mike Pence. I like, uh, of course, Governor DeSantis. So we've got it. We, we have a bench. They have no bench. That's right. <laughs> and And I think positive messaging looking forward is the way to bring those suburban moms back that. in. And we've got to we've got to be on track for that. Steve Moore, thank you so much for being with me today. I appreciate it. And hope you had a great Independence Day. You too. Thanks. Thanks, Martha. Take care. It's where North Georgia comes to talk. It's the Martha Zoller Show on AM 550 and FM 102.9 WDUN. Bill Crane is joining me uh, for Crane's Corner, and Bill is also going to be filling in for me later on this month when I am at a State Board of Education meeting. So we welcome you, Bill. How are you? Welcome back, and it was uh, fun with your guest host last week, but Martha, it's never the same. Oh, thank you, thank you. Listen, um, you know, the Hunter Biden thing, and we want to talk about a couple of things that aren't necessarily Georgia today, but... Uh, first, the Hunter Biden thing. You've got this WhatsApp message, um, which he could have been saying his father was sitting right there and he wasn't sitting right there. That is that is what they are alleging is that he just said that. Um, but there just can't, continues to be more and more smoke. You know, you've got that. And then it doesn't help that they found cocaine at the White House over the weekend, two days after Hunter Biden was there on his way to Camp David. And again, it's a holiday weekend. But it feels like since they've done the, um, you know, the plea deal with Hunter Biden, that 
that President Biden is trying, you know, if I were President Biden, I'd be telling Hunter Biden, keep a low profile. Let's just keep you out of the news until this is all settled. But no, they've taken the different tact. We want him to be at state dinners. We're going to have him go to Camp David with us. We're going to do all this other kind of stuff. Your thoughts on all of this? Well, presidential family members and politicians and their family members in general, you know, sometimes they can be of great benefit. Sometimes they can cause you great pain. If I was Joe Biden, I would be treating his son much more like Jimmy Carter treated Billy Carter in the first term of his presidency, basically telling Billy, can't stop you from having Billy Beer and some of these other things going on, but please go back to planes and leave me alone and let <laughs> me run the country. Um, I think Hunter Biden is not just prone to these things. Um, I, I believe he's looking at the plea deal as sort of a get out of jail free card. But, you know, and if it were you or I, Martha, who didn't file income taxes for two years or who had foreign business dealings and didn't report that income and then lied and falsified documents and a gun permit or anything, it wouldn't be a five-year investigation and a slap on the wrist. So I think it's it's more of a drag on Joe Biden's presidency heading into his attempted re-election campaign of how many things in Hunter Biden's life has he overlooked. And there are things that are not really discussed, but just kind of raised questions about Hunter's character, like when his brother passed away of brain cancer, which his father sometimes confuses as having been while serving in Iraq in combat duty. He was uh, in Iraq. He was there in combat for about eight months, but most of the time he was the uh, army judge. Uh, Hunter Biden left his wife for his brother's will. I mean, just things that in terms of character, are sort of beyond the pale. So if I were Jill and Joe Biden, he's their son and you still love him. But I I would certainly, for the good of the family and the good of the political party and the nomination, if they really want Joe Biden to win, I'd be putting in some distance. But it doesn't appear that that's what they're going to be doing. Well, and you're you're seeing traditionally sources of media that are thought this was nothing, like the New York Times, the Washington Post, and others, that are now reporting on this stuff. And they are they talking They don't have a choice it. at this point, <laughs> but you're not seeing them really yet, and you will probably like they did with the laptop, apologize for overlooking this previously because they, they perceived it as conspiracy threats or being drummed up by Trump supporters. Yeah, he's a mess. And, you know, I get you love your kid and all of that, but, you know, there's also a thing called tough love, and I, they've probably tried that too. But you've, you've also got a guy that just recently went in on a private jet to dispute that he could afford child care, I mean, child support on a child that is biologically his, but he did not want to claim. I mean, that's just CD2. And, it, it's just you would be putting I think you would be putting distance. And if Hunter Biden's last name was Trump, I think you'd see the media doing no, he'd a be lot being more. eviscerated right now. But if you just if the president wanted to just remind them, he said Hunter Biden admittedly is an addict. And I'm not casting aspersions and saying that person is a bad, a bad character because of that. But clearly there's still issues that need to be addressed in treatment. Yeah. And so if nothing else, send him to Betty Ford. Yes. Um, let him get some help. Yep. No, you're right about that. Now, the other thing I thought was interesting in the news today is that, you know, California started, I had forgotten, they had started this travel ban like seven years ago, and it was against Oklahoma and and North Carolina, and they thought they were going to teach everybody a lesson about how they should act because they were going to keep people from traveling from California on state business to these states. Well, now there are 24 states that have laws they don't like, which is basically half the country. Um, so, you know, what is what do you think about this? Oh, it's ridiculous. And California is really losing a bigger battle than just trying to ban travel by their state employees. They're us- losing population and they are losing population to states like Texas, Georgia, Florida, North Carolina, and not just hundreds, thousands. California is losing more population. Of course, it is 20 percent of the nation's population, so its scale is larger. They're losing re- bleeding residents faster than any other state in the country. And there's lots of reasons for that. Some of it's high taxation. Some of it's the economy. Some of it's homelessness raging out of control in multiple cities and crime in some cities like San Francisco, where they basically decriminalize things like shoplifting for under $2,000. And people are rolling grocery carts into CVS stores and loading up their buggy and then heading out the door without stopping. 
Um, but all of that quality of life stuff is easily outweighed by silly legislation. And so in that, there really is not a two-party system in place in California at present. And the state hasn't had really a challenge at that level. But I'm, arguably, I'm, Pete I'm, Wilson was governor in, in the one term of Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'm um, sure I, I think they're in for more. I'm sure you've seen the interview with Hannity and Gavin Newsom. And um, they are, and, and Newsom was like, defending all of this stuff saying how great the economy was in california and how they had a surplus and how they had this and that and and i was just like gavin newsom you look in a mirror and you see a president looking back at you i understand that's why you want to defend all of this but when you get out in the country it's not going to fly well they had a surplus because of covid they had a surplus because they received substantially, and they should have been, 20% of the nation's population is in California. That was tricky. Um, but they had a $66 billion surplus because of ARPA and the two COVID relief acts of the Trump and Biden administration. They do not have a surplus now. I believe currently they have a $33 billion deficit to put that in scale. That is the entire state of Georgia's budget yeah. in an annual year. Absolutely. Um, but I do think Gavin Newsom also would, is among those who would like to see some of these legal challenges to the Biden family trip up President Biden um, and his re-election campaign. And then they look, start looking for who, who can throw the whole Hail Mary Yeah, pass. Gavin, Gavin Newsom. Laden, Gavin Newsom. Gretchen Whitmer has started a federal PAC. Um, there's a couple of people out there, governors, that are looking at this from the Democratic side because, you know, the Democrats' convention in 2024 is at the end of August, which is about as late as you can have it. And it's unusual because usually if you're the incumbent president, you want a long general se- general election cycle. Um, but, uh, you know, they don't they're not doing that this time because they may have to put someone different in. And you know what? I think there's probably it's a it's a bigger chance every day that the Democrats are going to have to put someone different in there. And if you haven't read it, and I recommend it to your listeners as well, there's a great detailed interview with Robert Kennedy in USA Today's edition on the 4th, um, an entire page of USA Today, a section that gives bio of various positions and what he'd like to do when he's a Democrat, seeking the nomination against uh, Joe Biden. But I think I've seen any legacy media outlets and national print outlets give him that much opportunity to kind of give his side of the story. Putting the talk in news talk. It's the Martha Zoller Show on AM 550 and FM 102.9 WDUN. Joey Martinick uh, works for the Archdiocese of uh, Atlanta, and he also directs. Uh, and there's a play, uh, called a musical called Garden, which is the story of Adam and Eve. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Joey, welcome to the program. How are you? Doing great, Martha. Thank you so much for having me. So tell us about Garden. Well, uh, yeah, so, I mean, it's it, it's a labor of love flowed out of my um, heart. So I was originally inspired by my friends who are musicians, Greg and Lizzie Boudreau, and they, they made a, a, an album together just off the experience of them dating and getting married and the joys and struggles of that in their early married life. And that was a standalone album that I heard and then felt inspired to write a musical around that music telling the story of adam and eve uh in scripture so we eventually joined forces and and now now we have a have a a full-length musical and that was um it was like six years ago is when we did the first production of that in new orleans so it's really exciting that this in a few weeks we'll be doing the first uh the georgia premiere of the play and where's that going to be Uh, It's going to be in Roswell, so it's going to be in the theater of uh, Blessed Trinity Catholic High School, Uh, but it's it's an all kind of adult production. It's not a high school production. Um, So, yeah, we're really excited about it. It's been going well. We've got some incredibly talented local actors and um, lots of different people involved, like a live live band, and it's it's going to be something special. So, how is this different? You know, I mean, my daughter was a drama kid all through school and high school, and then she was an actress for about seven years uh, after she got out of college. And she, of course, played Eve and Children of Eden, which is a play that a yeah. lot of people know that tell a similar story. So, what's different about Garden? 
Yeah, okay. I mean, different on multiple levels. It's funny you bring up Children of Eden because, yeah, there, 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 there are some some significant differences in that. One would be like, um, for for those who don't know Children of Eden, it it really tells the story of a lot of Genesis, and it really starts from the beginning, but goes all the way through, like the Noah and the flood accounts. And so, like, Garden doesn't go there. It really focuses on Adam and Eve. And it spends a lot more time, the garden does, spends a lot more time before the fall happens. And this is what's so, I think, unique about the, the place and the, and the time in which we live today is we, are, we have forgotten what it means to be human. We are very, very confused about, like, what, what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be a man, a woman? And we're trying so hard to figure that out in this confusing world today um, but our uh, one of our Catholic figures that has written a lot and prayed a lot on this on the on Scripture and on on God's Word and on the words of Christ really believed John Paul II believed that the only way we can understand what it means to be human is by following the words of Christ and going back to the beginning. You know, Jesus says, like in the beginning, it was not so when all the confusion questions of marriage and divorce are brought to him. He's like, in the beginning, it was not so. Like, we have to go back to the beginning before the fall happened, before sin, to really get a glimpse of what God's original plan was for man and woman. And that's why I think it's so unique is that it's it's a story for all of us. Like, it, it hits in like a vein in our humanity that we recognize of like, wait, this is my story. This is not just a story. This is like, this is my history, and and this helps me make sense of the world in which I live today and my own experiences. I, I'm so glad you mentioned Pope John Paul II because I've read his works extensively. I'm not Catholic, but I've I had a great um, a great feeling towards him, and he was just one of those unifiers, you know. And he was a man for everybody, and. It was somebody you could, everyone could get something out of his writings. And he came into the papacy in 1978. And I have this theory that I talk about a lot on the show is that we're kind of in this cycle like we were in the 70s. The difference is we got social media and we've got this ability to amplify it all around the world immediately all at once and create all this confusion. But in the 70s, we had a lot of violence in the cities. There was a lot of people leaving the cities and, and trying to find themselves. There was a lot of, of confusion about role, what roles were. There was a lot of other things that happened uh, in the 70s. We had a lot of political upheaval in the 70s. Mm. And, and, and you had these three figures that came along, Pope John Paul II and then later Margaret Thatcher and, and President Ronald Reagan, who in a lot of ways uh, get, I think, I personally believe, provided the kind of leadership and vision that allowed people to do the right thing. Because I don't think that, um, I don't think that a human can make another human do things. But a human can give guidance and inspiration and vision so that other people can model their behavior after that. Obviously, the only person that can change your behavior is Jesus Christ, and that mm-hmm. he does that internally uh, when you accept him, And in my view. Uh, but it's so interesting that you mentioned him, because I think, I think this is a perfect time for something like this, Joey, because mm-hmm. we are in this place right now where there is noise and confusion and a lot of people saying what is right, but you know what they're saying is not right. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, I mean what, what he what he spoke to in that time, in the he he started delivering these addresses that were that began with uh, telling the story of Adam and Eve. Really, that in the Catholic world we call this the theology of the body, and that's in 1979, like just like you're saying, and it's coming out of this the the sexual revolution has just happened, and we are still dealing with all the debris from the sexual revolution. What is, what is the biggest idol? One of at least the biggest idols in in the world today uh, is, is a kind of a distorted view and understanding of our human sexuality. The only way John Paul II believed to uh, be delivered from this idol is not by trying to shun it away and pretend just like it's not there or 
overlook it or, or, or make it into something bad and dirty and awful. The only way is to, is to actually rec- transfer like the power of this being an idol that takes me away from God to allow it to be an icon that leads me deeper into the mystery of God. Our bodily masculinity and femininity, our sexuality from the very beginning was meant to be an icon that actually led us deeper into the heart of God. Uh, like I, I believe it's Ephesians says in, the, in the, like Ephesians one chapter four, God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. What we're seeing in God creating marriage and creating uh, why even create a masculinity and femininity of sexuality is because God is foreshadowing ultimately through the difference the complementarity of the sexes, his plan for union with us that would only be fully realized in Christ, as you said. So yeah, I think it's absolutely uh, the, the right time for this. And what's really cool about this is this is something that Catholics and non-Catholic Christians can totally get on board with what, what he's saying. Like we, we want to be able to share the treasures of what he's written with our Protestant brothers and sisters who are not Catholic, but, could really benefit and already agree with the basic principles of what he's laying out, but just can, this can take them deeper. So tell us all the details about garden. How can people get tickets? How can they see it? And when will it be? Yeah. So you can find everything at garden, the musical.com. That's garden, the musical.com. There's two weekends only of performances, July 27th through 30th and August third through sixth so last weekend in july first weekend in august like i said it's in it's in roswell there's uh yeah there, there there's there's been a, a, a tickets are selling pretty fast uh, i would uh, if you're we we have sold out actually the first production in new orleans sold out completely for every performance um but i think i think you, i think you're good today if you if you're able to hear this and, and buy tickets um yeah, what, what other information would be helpful? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So, garden. The, the real thing is the website, and I'm going to go on and try to get my tickets um, just as soon as we get off because I would love to go see this. And I would say to people, if you're Christian, if you're not Christian, if you are Catholic, take try to go and see this. Try to go and find this out because that's the way we're gonna we're gonna get back to where we need to be is for us to all be at the table together for us to all talk together because we can find that way back and you know i'm hopeful that we will i always say you know i was a teenager in the 70s so i thought the 70s were pretty great my parents looked at it differently you know (laughs) but um you know i was just i was just doing my thing as a high school student in the 70s but um it is it it is important um that we keep these messages strong and that we keep being a voice in the wilderness and that's really what what we're trying to do joey i appreciate that you are so passionate about this and i have loved working with you on all the projects that we have worked on together because um you know if you folks if you hear joey he is what he is and you're always going to get the same thing when you deal with him and i love that i love to work with you too martha it is so great and it's it's so interesting too i mean this like in other things we worked on in a much more like political focus agenda. What's, what's cool about this is it kind of transcends, you know, some of the laws and stuff that we work on in other, in other aspects. And it just, yeah, it becomes a, it becomes a bridge for, like you're saying, everybody to just encounter that of like, um, too, too often, unfortunately, I think in the, what we see in a lot of art these days is we're being slammed with these, political messaging and it kind of we we feel that we react to that of just like oh this again like i'm just trying to enjoy beauty and art and so that so yeah that that's what garden really takes us into that that beauty like we believe that true beauty actually connects with what is most true about our humanity and we just need to kind of like let that unravel and god god does the rest so yeah it's exciting to to have a different medium to to work in this space as well. Joey Martinek at The Musical is Garden. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Martha. Have a great day. It's local radio, and that's why you're listening. It's the Martha Zoller Show on AM 550 and FM 102.9 WDUN. Representative Brent Cox is here with me right now, and 
Um, we, I, I invited him on. He reached out to me uh, before I went on vacation, uh, and it was right after the um, the kind of Nazi protest outside of a, a Cobb County synagogue. And he was quoted in an article um, that was titled "Christian Lawmaker: How Can They Do This to My Synagogue?" And so I wanted to have him on to talk about that. Uh, Brent, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah. Thanks as well. It's great. And it's Friday, so that's even better. So tell us a little bit, just give us the background of how you ended up one, it being interviewed for this article and what your connection is. So the, about 20 years ago, um, I had a phone call to go down. They were They were at the synagogue creating a meat and dairy kitchen at the synagogue. So you have two separate kitchens and the business that I'm in and kind of the ventilation and hood systems and mechanical engineering world, they were needing some help. So when I went down there, I didn't know that I was going to meet with the rabbi. I thought I was going to meet with a superintendent of a job site and the rabbi was there. And, um, so that was the beginning of a 20 year friendship that occurred. And just tell us about, you know, because I wrote a column today that's going up about anti-Semitism and how it's everybody's problem. Uh, It shouldn't be just something we think about related to the Jewish community because intolerance of religion. I mean, the two cornerstones of this country are freedom of speech and free exercise of religion. And that is the foundation on which everything else is built. And... um, you know, it's important that we understand all of that. So tell us a little bit about what you thought when you heard about the story. And then what can we do? Because we weren't exactly able to pass the anti-Semitism law in the session last session. But um, what can we do to help prevent this in the future? Okay, so I know it's a big question. Sorry. (laughs) No, it's it's fine. Um, So from that moment that I met Rabbi Silverman, it led to, um, I guess, an awakening in my own mind. And, and really, I think just my faith as a Christian, I just realized that if it wasn't for the Jewish faith, I don't have my own. And I think a lot of times as Christians, we overlook where our foundation truly has come from, which led to Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, uh, Pentecost, Passover, a lot of the holidays. So our family started celebrating those holidays. And as we, we started celebrating the holidays and my kids were young then, now my grandkids are doing the same. Um, I continued to have communication with Rabbi Silverman and, um, you know, it's, it's just been a really good, a great friendship. So, so what's occurred now is I heard that and we were working on HB 30 this past session and unfortunately it got stalled and, and, you know, I, I believe we're going to get past the finish line this, this upcoming year. Um, when I saw the Nazi flags flying, I was like, okay, that was bizarre. And then I looked closer and I saw that it was the East Cobb synagogue. It was literally where my friend's, uh, synagogue was. I was, uh, just disgusted. I, I, I couldn't believe that in 2023 that we were at a place that this was that this truly was happening uh, before our eyes. So it led to um, the AJC, Greg Bluestein. He knew that there were some friendships there, so he had reached out to. to he wanted to, we wanted to bring light in the midst of darkness, and that kind of was Rabbi Silverman's whole message was. We, we overcome this by just continuing to build friendships amongst our neighbors, that we stand together, unified, that this hate's got to end. So that's really been the push is just, I mean, how hard is this? Love your neighbors. It's not complicated. But um, we still have some people that are bad actors that continue to try to just drive hate and division is it true because i read the initial reports on this group that this was some group out of california is that correct that came here yeah it was not people from here now the interesting part across from the synagogue is mount bethel methodist church which just had a huge um and, and they're friends of mine as well i have some business uh clients that 
actually go to the church over there, but they just had a lot of stuff going on with the Methodist church, ironically. Um, but they, they went into, they were trying to park on the Mount Bethel side, and Mount Bethel has stepped up to support the synagogue. Ironically, we were there yesterday just showing support and unification that we all are here for each other. But the people, from what we understand, came from out of town. They were not from Georgia, although the problem is, even though not being from Georgia, they still still could set the seed for something bad to happen from people that just don't understand. So, Shondell, I mean, your children are half Jewish. Your husband was Jewish. Um, You know, and this is probably something, I mean, gosh, you were married to Dan a long time. And I'm sure even when you married Dan, it was probably, uh, I mean, it probably wasn't that big of a deal that you married a Jewish guy. But I'm sure there was some a little bit there. So how are your children, how are you responding to this kind of rise in anti-Semitism that you're seeing? We really don't talk about it too much. Um, I think this was such an isolated incident, in my opinion. It was just a bunch of you know, losers. It's like Westboro Baptist Church. It reminded me of the Westboro Baptist Church, Brent. That's what it reminded me of, is just a few people that are making things bad for everybody else. It kind of reminded me of the Forsyth County situation, which was maybe 20, 30 years ago, where a couple of um, white supremacist Klan members came out, and the response was tens of thousands of people from Atlanta came up the next week. That's kind of how I feel like this situation developed. You had this, you know, these few people, and then you had an outcry from the community, which I think is a very positive step. There, there, was, there was also incident down in Macon. So mm-hmm. it wasn't isolated just to the synagogue, and there also has been significant amount of flyers that have been put in people's yards uh, Jewish homes all over the Atlanta area, and it has increased um, more than you would probably know. Now, but down in down in Macon, that was a big event as well. So Senator uh, Ossoff reached out to me to get your contact information because he read the article. Did he reach out to you? I haven't heard from him um, yet. I do know that he's reached out to Rabbi Silverman, but. You know, it's, the the point is, is that we we have to one at at the general assembly. We've as a as a team, we've got to get HB thirty passed so that we can get this behind us. But more importantly, um, continuing to have civil discourse is so important in our society, and it's not just this is bipartisan to me. I mean, this isn't. Republican, Democrat, that's irrelevant. Right now, this is about a group of people that get targeted that should not be targeted. And honestly, we need to encourage our Jewish friends, um, be bold. Um, We believe in you. Take ownership of who and, and, and what you're about and what your heritage is because there's just a great tradition and great faith in the Jewish community. And I want to make sure that they know that we have their back. And the HB 30 bill you've referenced a couple times has to do with making anti-Semitism a hate crime. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll get that across the finish line next year. Representative Brent Cox, thank you so much for being with us today. To hear the full versions of last week's Martha Zoller shows, go to the podcast page at accesswdun.com. And you can follow me on social media at Martha Zoller.